Welcome to today's webinar, a conversation about the growth and opportunities of the medical isotope sector in Canada and abroad. My name is Andrew Cardozo and I'm president of the Pearson Centre and we're delighted that you could join us. I want to start by recognizing that the Pearson Centre is headquartered on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. We thank them for their welcome and their wisdom and we welcome our speakers and audience who are joining us from across Turtle Island. As you may know, the Pearson Center established was established nine years ago in 2013. Uh, we're a progressive think tank that regularly brings together uh, people from a wide cross section of Canadians, from all political parties, business, labor, uh, this uh, civil society groups, and people from all backgrounds to address the challenging economic, social, and global issues of the day. As we like to say, we bring people and ideas together. A special thank you to all our donors and sponsors. Many of you are here with us today. Uh, you make these sessions possible. And if you like this kind of event, uh, I do want to encourage you to visit our website, thepearsoncenter.ca, and make a donation of your own so there can be more of these type of thoughtful sessions in these exceptional times of change. Let me quick, quickly mention to you that we have uh, a, a few webinars coming up. On Friday, April the 1st, we will have a session to mark the 40th anniversary of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and our annual conference will take place April 10th to 29th, over three weeks. We will have 10 webinars, and that'll constitute our annual conference, so please join us for all of that. Just briefly on the format for today, there will be a moderated discussion with our panel for about 45 minutes, and then we will take questions from you, the audience. Uh, so please use the question box on the screen and send in your questions. We'll get to as many as we can, and we will wrap up at 1.15 Eastern time. So, medical isotopes. What is this technology? What is its importance? How do we use it safely? How do we grow the sector, and how can we help economic recovery post-COVID? We have a very impressive expert panel today, and I will keep my introductions brief so you can hear from them. A moderator, I'm glad to say, is John Aldag. John is a member of parliament for the British Columbia riding of Cloverdale, Langley City. He's also chair of the, import, of the important standing committee on natural resources of the House of Commons. Prior to being elected for this for the first time in 2015, he had a 30 year career at Parks Canada, where he led parks, historic sites and programs in eight provinces and territories. James Skoniak is Chief Development Officer and Executive Vice President of Operational Services for Bruce Power. Welcome back to the Pearson Podium, James, and thank you for your advice and participation over the years. Jennifer Chapin is Director of Commercial Projects at Laurent Laurentis Energy Partners, and before that was the Director of Operations Support with OPG's Nuclear Waste Management Division. Dr. Andrea Armstrong is Assistant Professor and Research Scientist at McMaster University, where she's been responsible for oversight and radiostroke research and development for the Nuclear Operations and Facilities Unit at the University. Ram Mulur is Vice President for Isotopes Business at the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. His, his specialties include new technology evaluation and product licensing. I regret to say that we have one change in our program. Yvonne Jones, the Member of Parliament for Labrador and Parliamentary Secretary to, the, Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources, was not able to join us today, but we look forward to hosting her at another session uh, in the near future where we can address these issues. With that, over to you, John Aldag. Hey, well, thank you uh, so much, Andrew, for the opportunity to be here today, and thank you to each of the panelists for bringing your particular expertise uh, to us. We have about 40 minutes to cover a few questions and um, to help kind of set the stage, I'm going to start with James. And James, for context, um, I, I always love following what other levels of government are doing and um, was interested to see the last November Ontario passed a historic isotope motion in their legislature um, where they recognized the value of isotopes to the Canadian economy as well as the profound impact that isotopes have on healthcare. 
So if you could uh, maybe start us off by giving us your sense of what those contributions are to Ontario and why this motion was passed in the legislature is so important for both Ontario and Canada in building momentum for the Canadian isotope industry. Yeah, no, thanks, John. And I, I, I think that was a really important milestone. I mean, I sort of look at this from, from two perspectives. The first is by way of background and you know, we have a number of panelists here today, uh, whether it's McMaster University, whether it's CNL, uh, Jennifer from Ontario Power Generation slash Laurentis. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, the isotope supply chain right here in Ontario and frankly across Canada, everything from the production of isotopes to the processing of isotopes to clinical trials used to uh, develop new treatments. I mean, you name it, uh, Canada and Ontario are, are leaders uh, on that front. And so I often think, you know, as Canadians sometimes we're, and I think it's a good thing, but we're very humble and, and oftentimes we don't talk about our, our many strengths. And isotopes are an area that we, have punched above our weight for half a century. And so for me, what was very unique about the, the motion introduced in the legislature was supported by the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council, but the motion was brought forward by uh, Bruce Gray Owen Sound MPP, Bill Walker. And I know, John, you, you, know, you and your colleagues in Ottawa, I, I, you know, I don't think I, I'll, I'm always a straight shooter, so I'll call a spade a spade. I wouldn't exactly say that in our legislatures and our uh, you know, House of Commons in, in Western uh, uh, countries, though, there's a lot of things that we're coming together on. There's a lot of division in, in democracy, and I'm not going to get into all that today. But what I thought was very special about this motion was this was something that was unanimously supported by all parties. And so when we look at this as Canadians or we look at it as an Ontarians, I always like to say we're Canadians first. This is a strategic sector. It has huge opportunity uh, for us. But more importantly, the world is counting on Canada to play this leadership role. If we as a country do not continue to play the leadership role we have historically in isotopes and build on that role, there are people in the world that will not get the best cancer treatments. It's as simple as that. We will not be able to deliver modern medicine to emerging countries who want the same kind of healthcare system that we have here in Canada and want sterilization of their medical equipment. So for me, this is a fundamental um, um, obligation that we have as, a, have as Canadians to lead. And John, if I had my way over time here, I'd like to see every provincial legislature across the con country adopt a unanimous motion and the House of Commons because of all the things, of all the issues out there, this is something we can agree on and come together. Thank you, know, thank you for that. And, and I think, you know, to your point, the, uh, the fact that Canada has been leading in this area for 50 years, I, I think there's probably a whole hour long webinar that we could do on how we got to this point, the, you know, where it started from, how we got to where we're going, and then, uh, and then you know, the, what, what goes ahead. And I think that's what we're really going to be looking at today. Um, and, and I agree that I think that um, the type of motion that Ontario did is a great way of bring um, uh, really um, fo the focus or spotlight to a uh, sector in Canada that is, is really leading within the world. So um, well, I'll see what I can do here in the House of Commons to uh, further that, uh, that cause. And uh, we'll talk to some other uh, colleagues who have contacts across the country and see uh, you know, just what we can do to, to really support this, uh, this whole sector. Um, for um, yeah. yourself, James, go ahead. John, it sounds like we have an MP who's given up their private member's bill slot for the next uh, isotope motion in the House of Commons. Well, you know, unfortunately, I'm pretty low on the order of priorities or order of precedence. Well, so, um, I'll see if I can trade something up or perhaps work with the senator on this as well and uh, and see if we can bring something in from the Senate, which also uh, also works. But yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I was going to go uh, and continue with you, James, and also bring Andrea into the conversation. So last year, we the Canadian Nuclear Isotopes Council, the CNIC, hosted two virtual trade missions with Northern Europe and the USA. Um, I'd like to hear from you about why isotopes are such an important export for Canada and what role we play in the global supply chain, as well as what changes we can expect to see in the coming years. So lots there. Um, so maybe, first of all, um, contribution, uh, sorry, um, uh, why they're important export for Canada and uh, the role that we play in the global supply chain. And we are going to be spending more time on global supply chain uh, discussions. But if you can start with that, and then if you can maybe reflect on other changes we can see in the coming years, that would be useful. So, Andrea, James, who would like to start? Yeah, definitely. I, and I'm sure Andrea, Jennifer, and Ram will have some, some important items to add here. I mean, at the end of the day, when we think about exports, the, the first thing we need to think about are what, what are some of the advantages that Canada has that other jurisdictions don't? And if you look at how we can produce isotopes, whether it's with reactors at McMaster, 
Darlington Nuclear Plant, Pickering, Bruce Power. Um, we have an ability to, to produce isotopes uh, that, that no one else has. And it's not just nuclear reactors, it's cyclotrons like in your home province of British Columbia, John, with, with Triumph, we have cyclotrons all over Canada. So we have an unprecedented production capacity that actually has the potential to grow. We have an unprecedented supply chain around processing isotopes, target designs, medical research. So first and foremost, what's important to recognize is where you have a strategic advantage. And then when you have a strategic advantage and you can come, you can go out to the face of the world united, like the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council did, working with the Organization of Canadian Nuclear Industries, we're able to go into these jurisdictions and talk about the, the products and services that are available. You know, when you're dealing with the radio pharmaceutical sector in the world, you know, they're used to dealing internationally. And a lot of the items that, that people who are part of that trade mission, and there's literally hundreds of companies that participate in this ecosystem. There's many educational institutions as well. And the, the items that we're able to, to put on the table, the, the services and the capabilities are unmatched around the world. So it was really going out there, John, and saying, we are going to face the world together. And if we do that, we know Canada will become a natural magnet uh, for this type of activity. I mean, just to put this in perspective, the global radio pharmaceutical market is growing at about 10% per year conservatively. So the, the growth in this sector is astronomical. That tells me two things. It tells me that there's obviously an important opportunity for Canada and for Canadians and these organizations, but it also tells me that we have a world that continues to have a high demand for these kind of isotopes for cancer diagnosis, cancer treatment, medical sterilization, medical equipment sterilization, absolutely critical coming out of the pandemic. So we know that demand is there. And what I can also tell you is if Canada doesn't step into this space, there, there are no other countries that have this kind of ecosystem like we do. We are very, very unique with our can-do designs, with all those other attributes. So it's not only an opportunity, but it's a real challenge globally if Canada doesn't step into this. And I'll tell you, the, the response, and Andrew Thiel and the team did a fantastic job of, of pulling this together, was just outstanding. Excellent. Andrea, would you like to um, throw in you know, your contributions and, and for our other panelists, to Jennifer and Rob, if, if, yeah, feel free to, if you want to uh, have anything, uh, even if I haven't called out your names, please uh, jump into the conversation. But Andrew, I'll go to you to see if you have any additional thoughts um, on, on the questions I've put on the um, importance of these uh, medical isotope exports for Canada and um, the idea of the role that we play in the global supply chain. Sure, yeah. I mean, I'll start by echoing some of what James said is this is really an area of strength for Canada. Canada has been a leader in the medical isotope space since the 1950s. I mean, that's that's 70 years now. And what we really have that other countries don't is the full innovation value chain. So when we talk about medical isotopes, we always talk about the isotopes, but most of the time they get used in drug products. And in Canada, we're one of the very few countries in the world that has the capacity to do research into how do you make the radioisotopes? What's the next big radioisotope that's coming? Whether you're making that at Triumph, which has got the world's most powerful cyclotron, or you're doing that at a research reactor at McMaster, you've got that very basic science. What is the next big isotope? How do we make it? And then we've got universities and startup companies coast to coast all across Canada that are doing the work of figuring out what molecules seek out disease. And how can we attach these isotopes onto those molecules so that we can make a drug that effectively targets um, heart disease, cancers, and so on, so that we can come up with these personalized medical diagnostics for people. Um, it, it's so important, you know, 250,000 Ontarians last year alone uh, had health conditions diagnosed using medical isotopes, and tens of thousands more were treated using medical isotopes. So coast to coast across Canada, that's about one out of every 30 Canadians every year has some sort of diagnostic procedure done with medical isotopes. That's an enormous, enormous impact. Um, and we're able to lead in this space because we have the full innovation value chain um, from the basic research and development, different infrastructure that we can use to produce those small research scale experiments. And then the expertise in uh, preclinical research and in clinical trials and in manufacturing the medical isotopes into the drug products. Um, and that's something that not all countries have. Uh, it's one of the reasons that Canada has been able to, as James always says, consistently punch above its weight in this space. So if you look at the sort of top 12 medical isotopes that are used worldwide, Canada is a leading exporter of six of those. That's an enormous impact for a country our size. Um, and we're looking at, you know, 
one of the major milestones in medicalized dope space uh, actually occurred last week. The first uh, PSMA targeted drug has been approved in the US by the US FDA for general use. So this is a, a new lutetium-177 based drug that is designed to treat metastatic prostate cancer and it's been approved for, for general clinical use. That's really exciting because traditionally a lot of these medicalized dope therapies have been for sort of niche conditions, what we call orphan diseases. But prostate cancer, as we all know, is the most common cancer to affect men uh, in Canada and in many countries around the world. So we're seeing um, the rate of pharmaceutical space becoming much more mainstream and that means that there's going to be more and more demand for the medical isotopes that we need to make those drug products. One of the truly unique things that we have in Canada is our candy reactors. Um, they're very, very large compared to a research reactor. Uh, research reactors are where we make most of our medical isotopes. But as we start seeing the radiopharmaceuticals going into mainstream diseases that affect a, a large portion of our population, we're going to need larger and larger capacity to manufacture the medical isotopes. Uh, and that's something that CANDU technology offers um, to Canadians um, that's not available elsewhere in the world. Um, I'll stop and let other people talk. I'm sure other people have comments they'd like to make. Just sure, on this topic, um, Jennifer or Ron, do you want to uh, jump in or should we move on to the uh, the next? I, I am also really, well, you know, I'll, I'll let you answer that first, see if you want to contribute. Um, I'd just like to add to um, to Andrea's point and say, like, when we look at the can-do and the large-scale production potential, uh, that's where both the Bruce Power Project and the Ontario Power Generation, BWXT, um, project step in is really looking at taking some of the medical isotopes that historically have been, you know, either preclinical or niche market and, and actually looking at bringing them to large scale market and, and creating a more stable large scale supply. And I think there's a real opportunity um, to just bring through the full cycle into large scale commercial production and, and make use of our candy reactors that way. You know, historically we've made uh, cobalt 60, uh, both at Pickering and at uh, the Bruce Power site, and uh, we're looking to continue that at the Darlington site, but it's really exciting to be at a place, both on the medicine side and in the, the power generation side, where we can bring forward um, that kind of value to the medical community. I'm just wondering if somebody could contextualize for me, because as I was researching for today, I kept seeing that you know, Canada is among the leading countries in this medical isotope uh, sector. And, and, but it never said, you know, like, are we top, second, third, or, you know, what other countries are we competing against in this side, uh, in this field, um, uh, you know, as we look at sort of global competition and opportunities, uh, is, is there an easy answer to that? Do we know where we stand or, or are there different elements to it that make it just that we're, we're within the, you know, one of the leading nations? So, John, if I may uh, add, um, so absolutely. Uh, so Canada, uh, I think we should definitely be very proud and, and take credit for uh, bringing nuclear medicine um, to the world uh, in, in today's scale and form. Um, and this has been going on uh, very quietly, as James mentioned, Canadians are, are very modest and uh, very humble. And, uh, you know, this has been going on for the last 65, 60 years, uh, various isotopes. The first uh, um, FDA approved radio pharmaceutical was ID-131. Um, in a good part of uh, uh, those those uh, treatments and diagnosis diagnostic procedures uh, were uh, were because were enabled because uh, Canada could supply those isotopes in a lot of quantity uh, for the last uh, several decades, not years. And uh, and, and the NRU uh, was has definitely been the industry workhorse and the global uh, workhorse for isotope um, for the last several decades. And um, I think we should, we as Canadians, should be proud of what uh, what we have created and what we've enabled. Okay, well, uh, thank you for that. And and that's what I, I see is that there's this, and I think those within the sector uh, or within this field know all that Canada has been doing. But I think that it really is a story that more Canadians need to understand and, and really uh, and celebrate. Um, I'd like to, uh, you know, when we were talking the last question about global supply chain and, and how we fit there. And we have seen disruptions across uh, a number of sectors um, with the pandemic, with you now the war uh, in Ukraine, um, with, with just a whole number of factors that are out there. And are we seeing that there have been um, disruptions within the global supply chain in the medical isotope field, um, either related to our exports, or I don't know if we import um, related specific areas, but where are we at right now as far, as far as being able to uh, to move this very specific um, um, 
uh, necessary uh, commodity um, within you know the, the, the global realm of, of uh, nuclear medicine. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to some of the experiences we've had at Mac during the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic, of course, has been challenging for everyone. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we had is that uh, one of the medicalized soaps that we ship to Europe routinely is very short lived. It has to be used within 48 hours of leaving our facility. Uh, and typically, our medicalized soaps actually travel on passenger flights. So if you fly Air Canada from Pearson to uh, many European cities, you might be flying on a plane that has some of our medicalized soaps in the cargo hold. Um, and that becomes a problem when passenger flights get canceled. So right. we experienced a lot of challenges during the pandemic because there simply were no flights. And the airports, uh, sorry, the airlines were scrambling to put on cargo planes and so on, but there just wasn't the same uh, ability of, of planes to be traveling back and forth to, to um, make necessary treatments. The other thing that we noticed um, was the variability in demand. And it was a little worrisome, honestly, when you think about the human impact of not getting a medicalized soap treatment is we could really watch the pandemic moving around the globe by watching our isotope orders. Um, because countries that were in lockdown scenarios weren't treating cancer patients. And suddenly there would be drops in demands for medical isotopes uh, in China initially, and then that moved to Europe and so on and so on. So, um, and then when countries started opening back up, the, the demand doubles and triples to levels way, well, beyond, well beyond what we typically see. Um, and that's worrisome from a human standpoint, you know, because it means that patients weren't getting treated because the hospitals didn't have capacity to do so. We had times when um, customers were calling in orders and then they canceled them at the last minute because um, the doctors had prescribed a treatment, but at the last minute they were told they didn't have access to an operating room so they couldn't do the treatment. So from a, from a human standpoint, that's quite worrisome. Uh, a lot of those, uh, now that we're coming out of the pandemic, uh, a lot of that's returning to more normal. Um, we do have a, a new situation now, of course, with the current situation in Ukraine, which is um, it, it going to wreak havoc on the medicalized soap supply chain in, in the near future, I would think. Um, because Russia also is a country that flies a little bit under the radar on some of the things that they do. So Russia happens to produce um, stable isotopes. When we talk about medical isotopes, we're talking about radioactive isotopes. And we typically make them from a stable isotope. So when we make iodine-125, for example, it comes from xenon-124. Uh, when you make lutetium-177, it comes from ytterbium-176. I know it's a little bit gobbledygook numbers and letters. Um, but the point is that Russia is one of the very few countries in the world that produces these stable and rich isotopes. So we do have to worry about continued access to that very precious resource, um, because that is one capacity that Canada doesn't have. Um, and perhaps it's something that we should be looking at building in the future um, so that we do have um, all aspects of medicalized soap supply chain in Canada. I think that, you know, given the, the current world context, that's a, a very, uh, you know, appropriate and, and uh, important flag to be raising. And, uh, yeah, absolutely one that um, I'll be talking with uh, my colleagues here on the Hill about, uh, you know, how, how do we deal with that, um, especially as we uh, see, um, you know, restrictions being placed on doing business uh, with Russia and uh, Russian companies. Um, uh, Rob, did you want to weigh in on this one? Sure, sure. Thank you, John. Um, so yeah, so COVID definitely, uh, we're talking two years now, so so COVID definitely had a very unfortunate impact on in a variety of ways. Uh, first of all, as, as when it struck uh, two years ago, uh, what we saw in the industry was basically uh, many procedures uh, being cancelled. Right off the bat, several nuclear medicine diagnostic and, and uh, uh, believe it or not, some therapeutic procedures are canceled and, and, and patients uh, bore the brunt uh, of that impact. And, um, it, you know, this was very unfortunate because of the, uh, of the uh, need for the treatment and the diagnosis and the disease progresses, doesn't wait for uh, other things that are happening. So as that slightly got alleviated, uh, what we started to see in the industry was uh, the general disruption. You know, the flights, uh, the number of flights reduced, as Andrea mentioned. Uh, and passenger flights and freight, uh, there were lockdowns. Uh, the, the, the isotopes became, were traveling more distances uh, with their half-life, uh, so we are basically getting less material. Um, and, and also, as many of the countries where the isotopes come from, they were facing uh, public health uh, lockdowns, and uh, they were uh, having problems to, uh, staffing, and uh, and people coming to be able to come to work. Uh, you know, this is not an area where you can work uh, kind of from home. So, so we definitely saw the industries saw um, a multitude of challenges uh, due to COVID. 
and, uh, and and the good news is some of those uh, um, um, situations are being alleviated and uh, and well while while we just thought we are really getting over the hump uh, we get hit with uh, what used to be a geo health crisis uh, what we're seeing today is a geopolitical crisis and uh, once again as Andrea mentioned um, uh, isotopes are being hit because of that and and this would have a lasting impact uh, uh, clearly as we can see today. And uh, so all in all, oh, I, I see the industry, uh, um, uh, Canadian, in the, can, Canadian, Canadians in, uh, especially, and the industry being a victim of a serial of external impacts uh, beyond everybody's control, because there's so few uh, 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 centers and infrastructures which cater to this demand, and this demand is public health, which is universal. So, so all in all, it tells me is uh, Canadians, uh, we should definitely do uh, what it takes to reduce our exposure to these external events. And uh, quite frankly, we are we are uh, the best to do it because we, we have institutional foundation, uh, a legacy where we've succeeded and led. So we should build upon uh, those uh, uh, foundations we have, the institutional foundations, uh, technology-wise, talent-wise, skills-wise, and, and really put together the new generation infrastructure. Uh, for, to, to enable the medical isotopes uh, and radiopharmaceuticals. Um, mm -hmm. And then meanwhile, while this is all happening, supply is trained, the demand is increasing. The demographics, the epidemiology, trends, they all point to more and more need of these kind of treatments. So um, I think we find ourselves at a very important juncture. Yes, absolutely. And, and I'm going to take that and move to uh, James and Jennifer, and, and you've touched a bit on this, Ron, but um, basically going to look at next in this context of, of global um, conflicts um, that have put these pressures on global supply chains. I'm wondering if, uh, James and Jennifer, if you could speak to the role that Canada can play in mitigating the risks of these disruptions, and what is it that we need to do as, in Canada to be able to supply more of these medical isotopes? Um, so, you know, where are we at now with, with these disruptions and what role can Canada play in, in filling some of the, um, you know, the, um, the, the, the problems that we're seeing? You can go first, Jennifer. I think you're on mute, though. I was going to say, you go first. <laughs> um, it, you know, really, the... Uh, the big project that we're working on right now is with the Molly 99 production and you know historically Canada was one of the the big players in this field it's the most used medical isotope um, globally in terms of diagnostics um, of cancers and and heart disease and and other illnesses and historically we were the the world's leading supplier one of the world's leading suppliers that that supply shifted to uh, research reactors globally I think you know what we're looking to do through the project is really to bring that stability back home, um, and also by bringing uh, medical isotope production back into um, power reactor base where you know the outages are shorter and less frequent. Um, it really does stabilize supply, and it's going to stabilize the supply not just for us but globally um, as we increase the availability of some of the really key and, and high demand isotopes. Okay, James, anything further you'd like to say? But Jennifer said, I, I would really only add two, two additional points. The first is around, uh, I think Andrea is right on the money in terms of uh, uh, Russia. Um, look, we, we shouldn't or don't need anything from Russia, period. Um, and but 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 unfortunately, they they have taken a leadership role over many decades and and built this this position. I can tell you, you know, there's a real opportunity for Canada to step into the space, especially with Uterbium 176, which is uh, you know we just announced with uh, uh, our partners Kinetrix and Framatome with Premier Ford the launch of an Ontario um, uh, isotope innovation hub a number of weeks ago, and actually they're they're advancing the the production of uh, Terbium 176. But but you know that is totally within our reach to do, and we can do it very quickly. So uh, we just have to make a, a decision to to do it. And I think people are. I think John, the, the one area, and this is a generic. This is not meant to be a political comment. It's a generic comment on government. But you know the government uh, policy tools that are in place are move far too slow. So, you know, if I look at, if I take a step back, it's been this way for a number of years, you know, 
coming out of budgets, you know, all, uh, governments of all stripes have come out with very strong programs, uh, whether it's the Canada Infrastructure Bank, whether it's a strategic innovation fund as, as part, of, part of your government. And, and oftentimes what happens is, is that from the time, you know, the, the policy instruments that are put in place would provide huge benefit very quickly. But if by the time within the, the, the process, if it takes two, two and a half years to actually get through an application, a due diligence process, by the time that two and a half year process is complete, we've missed the opportunity. Um, and I know as a sector, for example, we came, came together with a very modest, uh, within the Strategic Innovation Fund, $20, $25 million program that would all be leveraged with private sector investment. Because some of these areas initially aren't economic, but you want to strategically do it for these reasons. And I'm not, I'm not uh, in any way knocking SIF, but I'm saying that sometimes governments need to move quickly in these markets, because if you don't move quickly on it, you know, agility counts for something. When you're punching above your weight, you need to be agile. And, and I do think sometimes with some of those, areas, one of the areas where I think we have been very agile is with our regulatory environment in Canada, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, taking a graded approach, you know, never compromising safety, never compromising standards, but prioritizing items around medical isotopes. I know Jennifer would probably agree with their, their project at Darlington, ours at Bruce, um, you know, made sure there was a, a risk informed process that was graded and that that happened robustly that could could be a four-year process it was probably a year-long process in in both of our cases so i think we've made some progress but i think in some of these policy instruments you know this tends to fit john in the infrastructure space and infrastructure projects tend to be set up with a 10-year run life and so we gotta we gotta kind of carve that out and say if we're gonna get in there we need to be agile and you know i think the government's done a great good job of setting up the the policy instruments they're just not moving quick enough. And, and that, that, that's a problem we can easily fix, but if we don't call it out, we can't fix it. No, absolutely. I appreciate that. And in my role as the chair of natural resources, these are the types of issues that we like to hear about so we can try to find solutions. And I would assume that, and maybe this is wrong, but you know, in this area of medical, um, the medical field and research, the things do move fairly quickly and that um, you know, as you develop new treatments, new or new solutions or, or whatever it is that you're, um, you know, developing that um, you, you need to be move, able to move fairly quickly to take advantage of those opportunities and get things into uh, into the medical field. So yeah, I, I hear you. Josh, you yeah. hit the nail on the head with that, and maybe just to, to build on what you said, I think one of the other challenges this sector has is when you go around and work with different government departments, the support is fantastic everybody is there but there's not really also a because it's such a unique field and very niche it's not clear is this in resource is it in health is it in in what i would call industry i know it's called something else now where does it fit is it in uh, is it in economic development is it in the so 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 i think that's also something that from a government perspective about you know where where does this fit in somebody's mandate letter right so it's clear uh, and, you know, you, the challenge you have in, in Ottawa is you have so many files as a government, you have so many urgent files, and it's these niche items that can kind of sometimes get a little bit lost uh, in those areas. And, and I don't think isotopes is the only one. So that, that's why dialogue like this is really constructive and helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's, let's continue on because I know that we're going to get some questions from the audience within about 10 minutes and uh, there are still a couple of other questions. So James, with um, the uh, CNIC, what role does CNIC play in helping to advance the concerns of the sector and advocate for the needs of the industry through these challenges? So we were just talking a bit about that, but what can you and others do specifically to help address these concerns from that advocacy role? Um, and, and why is this, I think you've already touched a bit on why it's important, but if you want to elaborate on that, I think it would be really useful for people here because there may be a role in that advocacy role um, that others can play as well. No, John, I think it's a good it's a good question. And I mean, the way I sort of look at it is um, we just have to tell people about this sector in Canada. Like th there's not a big lobby. There's not a big ask. There's not a big push. There's not arm twisting. When people know what the sector is doing, can do, will do, you know, the alignment with government is really easy, right? So from a CNIC perspective, I see our role as really simple. We have to have as many people, uh, policymakers and the public um, hear this story and we're better to do that together. And more importantly, what the CNIC also does is breaks this down so it doesn't look, we're not competing against each other, anybody on this panel. Nuclear reactors aren't competing with, competing with cyclotrons like Triumph and, and BC. So this is also about creating a council that says, 
we're, we're not in competition. We all need the, the same things. And so it's really about people just understanding it in plain speak. And one of the problems we have, it's actually a good problem. Have, we have so many smart scientists, but sometimes this is so, such a complicated topic that we, we lose that sort of sound bite and that clarity, right? And, and you know this, John, better than anybody. As a policymaker, you have so many files come at you every day. So the CNIC is really to say, how do we package this up into something digestible for policymakers? And I can tell you, like many members of your government, we engage them. There's no arm twisting needed here. They're like, okay, what can we do? But, but CNIC is really to take it up to that sort of uh, that public policy level and, and make it clear. And I know that sounds simple, but that's really what we have. And that's what panels like this are so important for. Yeah, you know, and, and as I hear and and read, like you know, it, the, the research that's going on is, is absolutely amazing. You know, unfortunately, we we don't have a cure for cancer yet, but this seems to be an area that you know can help with treatments and diagnoses and 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 you know the, the um, opportunities are are really limitless right now. I would think, and so it's like, how do we actually move away from the barriers that um, the government can put up and 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 actually let the industry really flourish and uh, and, and continue innovating and, and finding solutions and uh, and, and uh, using that both domestically but also then for export internationally so that we can collectively can tackle um, huge issues like cancer and in, uh, in our population. So James, I have a, a bit of a, a technical question here. I'm going to read uh, this one. Um, just so I get it right, and uh, and hopefully you can provide some insight. And again, if anybody wants to weigh in on this, please feel free to. But it's a question that came ahead to us uh, from the sort of an audience uh, member who, who knew this was happening, and so they sent this in. And, and it's the kind of question we may get more of as we um, get into the uh, questions at one o'clock. Um, but the question is that there's another option, and uh, then the uh, author goes on to say there are no technical obstacles to convert from high enriched uranium to the use of low enriched uranium for the production of medical isotopes. This is being done successfully in smaller facilities in the world, uh, including in Argentina, Indonesia, and Australia. For Canadian suppliers, this would mean an initial cost of retooling, but thereafter the cost is similar. In the long term, there may actually be savings. The storage. Uh, for costs of weapons grade um, HEU uh, would no longer be a factor. So can you speak to this, this idea of, of um, high enriched versus low enriched uranium? And, uh, and I assume those in the sector know about this, but maybe if you could also give a bit of a, you know, a, a, a snapshot of, for those of us who are not as immersed in it, what the difference is here and, and what, um, you know, what's the, uh, uh, the, the solutions could be uh, as far as the um, lower grade. Uh, sure, rate. I'm sure my colleagues want to, want to jump in on this, but why don't, we, why don't we take this maybe back up to sort of a, a fundamental level just so everybody has a sense of sort of where we're starting with. So firstly, what is an isotope? An isotope is simply another form of energy, right? And and when you, when you expose uh, um, something like your terbium uh, uh, 176, to a power reactor that picks up energy and converts to lutetium 177 and what that what that isotope wants to do is get back to what it was before it was exposed to the reactor or the cyclotron and it releases an energy and we use that energy to diagnose or help treat cancer that's what an isotope is so you can you can use a cyclotron for certain types of isotopes and reactors for others within the context of canada i don't think we need to confuse the discussion with enriched slightly enriched uranium we have our can do reactors here in canada from for the isotopes you can make reactors and i'm sure jennifer will want to talk about this where essentially we have access points into the reactor that are designed safely designed and so i brought it to, i i did not know this question was coming but i always bring this prop this is one of our our isotope targets so we will load in 56 of these into the reactor at any one time one of these targets will provide prostate cancer treatment for 100, 100 people, just to give you an idea. You shoot this into the reactor using a pneumatic or air powered system. It gets exposed to the uh, energy in the reactor. It picks up neutrons and it comes out as an isotope. I think Jennifer is gonna tell you a similar process they're using to make molybdenum. So we don't really have to get into this discussion about you know, enrichment. We have these can-do reactors that have access to an existing neutron source that is a very, very clean and simple process. It doesn't really uh, result in any waste uh, and, and it's redundant, right? We have not just one research reactor, you know, we've eight commercial reactors at the brew site. OPG has commercial reactors at Darlington and Pickering. 
So, so John, that question would be a question posed if you were talking about making these in the United States or in the UK. But from my perspective, I don't think that's a that's a key consideration for us here in Canada. But my colleagues on the panel may have a different perspective. Sure. Yeah. If anybody else wants to weigh in, please. Maybe I could just speak for, for the peace of mind for whoever asked the question in the audience. Um, so there's a little bit of a terminology issue here where historically uh, in Canada, we've often used the term medical isotope to refer to a very specific isotope, which is Molly 99, which Jennifer will tell us all about. Um, so when we talk about producing Molly 99 historically, it has come from um, reprocessing nuclear fuel. Um, but many, many, many other radioisotopes, medical isotopes, as James said, are just made in a research reactor by adding a neutron or in a cyclotron by adding a proton and so on and so on. So there's, you know, two dozen different isotopes that are approved for use in human beings in Canada to diagnose and treat disease. Uh, and of those, really only Molly 99 is the one that traditionally comes from the reprocessing of uranium, iodine to an extent. Uh, but by and large, when we talk about things like lutetium, we're not talking about uh, isolating that from uranium reprocessing. Uh, and we're not talking about, um, you know, when you look at um, iodine-123 or any of the other newer medical isotopes, gallium-68, these are not coming from reprocessing nuclear fuel. They're coming from deliberately and rationally choosing to make a radioisotope by adding a neutron or a proton uh, at some of the infrastructure we have in Canada. So to the larger question of high versus low enriched molybdenum, people are moving away from the highly enriched material because it's so regulated. Really the only facilities that are staying doing the highly enriched processing are facilities where um, countries are anticipating a new more modern facility to come online soon. So they're not bothering to convert the, old, the older facility to using the, the lower enriched uranium targets. Um, but there's been a lot of research and innovation done that I'll stop talking and let Jennifer talk uh, about making Molly 99 that doesn't even require the use of uranium. It's a much cleaner technology. Okay. Well, Jennifer, you've been mentioned a couple of times here. So if you'd like to weigh in on this one, please feel free to. Yeah. So Andrea provided really good historical picture around production of Molly 99 and, and how that was done from irradiating normally highly enriched uranium targets. And so one of the things that's really exciting about this new generation of molly production for Canada is that it is a very low waste process. So rather than irradiating uranium, we're actually irradiating um, molybdenum 98 to make molybdenum 99. So absorbing a neutron through the reactor. Um, and then from that, you know, that gets reprocessed um, through radiochemistry, radiopharmacy, um, and out to the patients. And so we're not, so that waste was alluded to um, in the question, this new process really doesn't generate that waste anymore and it's one piece of how Canada's nuclear sector overall is really looking at its sustainability and decreasing its footprint and how it is that we contribute overall to a clean economy. Fantastic, thank you. We would, I, I know that Andrew's going to be coming back on with questions from the audience and so I have one more really quick question perhaps for, for Andrea. And um, I'm just wondering if you could reflect on what are the most critical changes that the isotope industry can make to meet future demand needs more effectively? I think we need to make sure to support innovation. One of the most exciting things that's coming out of Canada right now is these use of candy reactors for large scale medical isotope production. Um, they're not only large and have lots of neutrons in them, but there's multiple nuclear reactors at one site. So at a nuclear research reactor, you typically have one facility, there's one reactor. And when it's down for maintenance, there's no neutrons. Uh, that's the exciting thing that power reactors bring is there's several of them located at one site. So if one of them is on an outage, having something or other repaired or upgraded, there's other facilities there that keep on making those medical isotopes. So you have a lot of redundancy in your supply chain and you have an uninterrupted supply of medical isotopes. Um, and that's really important, especially as we're seeing the pharmaceutical sector and big pharma really investing heavily in the medical isotope and radiopharmaceutical space. Um, one of the things we need to make sure that we do, though, is continue to invest in the research, in the people who are developing the next generation of medical isotopes. So one concern that, uh, that's that been mentioned to me by several of my colleagues in Europe is um, the financial impacts of large-scale radioisotope production here in Canada, um, because a lot of the research reactors around the world rely on the sales of medical isotopes to pay their operating costs. I know that's certainly true of our research reactor here at MAC. So 
it's incredibly exciting to be able to scale up processes to the scale that makes it possible by, by utilizing Candy reactors. Uh, but we need to make sure that we're continuing to support the innovation space uh, because it's research reactors where we're going to be developing the next generation of medical isotopes that we can then put into places like Bruce Power and OPG to produce at large scale. So that's something I'd like to see the sector looking at. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I um, see Andrew has joined us again. So, uh, Andrew, do we have any questions from the audience that you'd like to put to our panel? Oh, are you there? I'm not sure if you're on mute still, we can't hear you. Okay, I think you can hear me now. Yes, you're good. Yeah, okay. Uh, we have had a couple of questions and I'll, I'll combine a couple of them. So one is how does Canada keep its competitive advantage and which countries are our key competitors? Um, maybe James, you can start. Sounds good. Well, I, I, I want to answer that the way I want to answer it, but I don't want to sound arrogant. So, uh, but, but, so that's my, that's my preamble, Andrew. So if this answer does sound arrogant, I, I think if we focus on all the things we talked about today, I, I am not worried about any country competing with, you know, being a, an impediment to Canada in any way, shape or form. I think there's enough of this market out there that the global market's growing enough that they'll take whatever they can get. I think the can-do reactors and our cyclotron capability has an infrastructure capability that would take decades for others to get into place. Um, and I think building off that core with all of the other areas that uh, Andrea and Ram talked about and others, you know, I think we're in the driver's seat. So I think what we need to focus on is not worry about what the other folks are doing. The market is there. It's about really aligning ourselves and making sure we're, we're, we're doing those items that we've identified as the CNIC that, that we need to do. So, and where other countries may make leaps forward in this area, I see that as complementary, not competition with us. I think there's a lot in this space. So, you know, it's not to say I'm not worried about the competition, but I'm actually not. I think we have to focus more of the, the projects that have been talked about, get those moving and expanded and, and move into other units. And honestly, Andrew, I don't know who else has anything that frankly competes with that. Okay, which and which other countries are are working in this space? So I think you would see, you know, we've talked about Russia has historically played a lot uh, uh, in this space. You are seeing existing research reactors want to continue to uh, to play in this space, but again, they can't do it at the level of reliability that you know Jennifer and I have talked about. And I think you're seeing a lot of other uh, uh, non-reactor folks come into play uh in the space which is probably more of a challenge to the cyclotron community but there's nobody that is stepping in with reactor isotopes to the scale that, that canada is could, could we see a situation where where a country with <clears throat> lower production costs a developing country for example could move in at a more competitive uh, price point i don't think so because it's such a high fixed cost you, you need the fixed asset andrew so if you look at uh Jennifer would have a sense of the economics of the late 99, but you're, you know, if you think about uh, the reactors at Bruce, or let's say, I don't want to speak for OPG, but we're paying the bills for the reactors selling electricity. So we don't have the reactor there to make isotopes. We're, we're paying, the reactors running to make electricity, and now we are adding a variable product on. So we're able to not only produce that at the volume that's been discussed, but you're only, you're only putting those variable costs of that incremental piece onto the isotope. I mean, so if, if others can find a way to make isotopes less expensive than we can on a can-do reactor, I'd be shocked, but would welcome it because I think that'd be good for the global health community. But but I think I think we're I, I don't see others playing in that space. I don't know I Jennifer I'll have on that. Just maybe add a little bit. The economics of medical isotope production, you know, that's one of the things that led to the Mali crisis back 10, 12 years ago, right? Is because we were the country that was selling an essential medical isotope below market value and below the production costs 
um, because we were paying the full operating costs of the NRU as a national research facility, and they were able to then subsidize the cost of the medical isotopes and keep costs very low. So there, there's a risk to doing that if you only have one specific country that's doing that and it doesn't have enough um, capacity. In terms of who the other research reactors or the other countries in this space, um, I don't see them as competition either. And I see that because we're part of a global community. There's 25 different medical isotopes in Canada alone that are approved for clinical use. Uh, in some parts of the world, there's more different radioisotopes that are available. Uh, it doesn't necessarily make sense for each country to have its own domestic supply of every single one of these radioisotopes, particularly some of the longer lived ones. You know, if you have a source, you only need to change it every six months or every year. Not every country necessarily needs to develop that. Um, and while we certainly have our strengths in Canada, other countries also have their strengths and, and they complement our strengths. Um, so your major players in this space are really Australia, Belgium, Netherlands, South Africa, the US and Germany is really taking a more and more prominent role, um, especially in the, gen in the generation of sort of next gen medical isotopes. Okay, does anybody else want to comment on the, on the global perspective? Now, I'll, I'll just add uh, to the themes. Um, uh, so in terms of uh, the, the capital investment needed uh, for getting into medical isotopes, that's pretty much a global uh, uh, pricing landscape. Um, so the, the point around uh, lower cost econ uh, low cost economies uh, getting into it and being more competitive uh, is, is such a small portion. Uh, there, there are huge investment hurdles and safety hurdles uh, which have international relevance uh, because they're controlled uh, uh, largely at a global level uh, to be overcome. So, so that uh, hurdle is almost international uh, hurdle. Uh, the, the low cost manufacturing aspect is somewhat less. So uh, all in all, we, we, we don't face a pricing threat. Uh, and more importantly, Canada has a leg up uh, of gen you know, decades of uh, um, lead in this space, both from a regulatory perspective both from a skills perspective, talent perspective. We've had nuclear reactors, research reactors. We have cyclotrons today, and, um, and, and we, we, we need more uh, diversification. You know, the reliance on HEU or LEU and reactor is one thing. The technology, the medical technology allows us to diversify from all that in this PET imaging, which has come uh, in the last 15, 20 years, uh, which does not rely on reactor isotopes. Uh, you know, we have cyclotrons uh, who can give a very high quality uh, PET isotopes which produce very high quality uh, images for medical community. Okay, uh, the next question is, can the panel describe if there are security measures to transport isotopes? And I don't know, uh, uh, Professor I'm Armstrong, happy, if you'd like to. I'm happy um, to take that, and the answer is not, we can't talk about it, uh, is, um, look, me medical isotopes are, um, for, from a safety perspective, for say, really well, known phenomenon. So, so the packages, targets like this would go in, would be approved packages by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Um, and they are, you know, they're short-lived isotopes, right? So they're not, um, you know, uh, you know, not not as much of a risk for, let's say, a nefarious type use, Andrew. Uh, you know, really well established international guidelines by the IAEA and associated regulatory uh, agencies around this. And I think, as Andrea said, you know, they they've been safely transported for decades in sort of typical commercial, you know, uh, vehicles. Uh, commercial flights uh, and and very routine kind of handling. So, you know, important we don't we don't confuse this with an area like nuclear fuel or or some of those other areas. That's a it's a real fundamentally different uh, uh, risk profile. Okay. So that's one of the advantages of moving um, moving towards the approach that they're taking at OPG, right, around Molly 99 production without enriched uranium. Um, because, yeah, transporting medical isotopes is not a security risk, but transporting enriched uranium is. So as we're moving away in Canada, we're not doing any manufacturing now that starts with enriched uranium. So it makes, uh, it, it gets rid of the security risk, it lowers the environmental footprint, it, footprint, it has a lot of beneficial aspects. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, can I just ask you for one clarification? You mentioned that um, when transporting isotopes have to be used within 48 hours of, of when they leave of the plant. Um, so does that mean they've got to be transported and physically used? Yeah, so it depends, it depends which isotope. I mean, there's some of the pet isotopes 
uh, we were just mentioning, you know, those have to be used within six hours of when they come out of the cyclotron. So things have very different, very different half-lives and there. Some are more perishable than others. So yeah, the one I was mentioning, it has to come from our facility. It has to go to Europe. It has to go to a processing lab where it gets suspended in an appropriate, uh, like a saline solution for implantation in the patient. They do full quality control checkouts and then it gets repacked shipped to a hospital and implanted in the patient all within 48 hours of when it comes out of the core of our nuclear reactor. So it's it's very logistics intensive. It's very stressful. Um, but it's I, very thought, I thought running a one hour webinar was, was stressful enough, but that, that sounds a lot, a lot more dicey, a lot more, a lot more stressful. Um, la last question, and, and I'm sure James, you'd like to take a crack at this, uh, but, but anybody else can join in too. What do you want to see in the federal budget next month? The word James. isotopes once. Well, definitely, I think, uh, as, as the panel indicated, uh, and, and, you know, the, there is here's an opportunity for Canada to reclaim its uh, leadership position. We've done it before. Infrastructure is needed. The demand from the medical community has never been higher before. There's been new drugs, um, unprecedented drugs, which have been approved recently, which are basically just the early start of what this trend for radiopharmacy could be. Uh, you know, diseases are being diagnosed and treated way differently than they were even just 15 years ago. There's disease phenotyping, which basically enables personalized and precision medicine, uh, you know, in terms of uh, it's not one, uh, one bullet for a, a range of diseases. Uh, you know, disease-specific biomarkers and, and, bio, and, and isotopes, which can be which could be latched on to those biomarkers uh, in a very specific way to treat patients uh, who were uh, being given broad spectrum treatment before is there. And all this points to basically new uh, isotopes need and more of them. The, you know, the, the research community has gone. I mean, it's not one thing which is causing this excitement. To me, there are a multitude of things. The new isotopes, alpha isotopes, which are coming, uh, replacing uh, the, the uh, traditional betas. Beta is itself that we are finding new ways of producing those beta isotopes. Uh, alpha isotopes, which have never been produced, are able to target uh, uh, diseases a lot better than they were, as opposed to where it was uh, a broad spectrum uh, causing a lot of side effects. Uh, and new uh, uh, scales, uh, you know, in terms of, and even the supporting technology, you know, isotopes have always been there, as we know. Pharmacy has always been there, as we know. But when you, when you put all this together, and even the supporting technology, camera, you know, uh, you know, theranostics, see what you treat and treat what you see. That's what the medical community is going for now. Uh, imagine, uh, you know, uh, having a, a diagnostic treatment with no uh, ability to treat a disease. What good does it do? That's changing now. Uh, the, yeah. the, there are new drugs which treat drugs, so diagnostics become more significant. And, and more and more diseases are coming under the umbrella of radiopharmaceuticals, unlike Okay, any other quick uh, thought on, on the budget? Uh, okay, great. Um, I, I want to ask uh, John Aldag uh, for a closing comment. Uh, John, in, in addition to being Member of Parliament for Cloverdale Langley City, you were Chair of the National Resources Committee. Um, uh, I wonder if you could share any thoughts, um, closing thoughts on, on our discussion so far. Yeah, well, first of all, Andrew, I'd like to thank you and the, uh, the Pearson Center for setting up today's session, everybody who joined us online and our panelists. Uh, this is a, um, a sector, um, a field that uh, you know, I didn't know a lot about. I, I think Andrea mentioned the crises of a decade or so ago, um, and, and I remember you know, hearing about that and, and just kind of like, oh, I never knew that Canada was in this field or this business, and, and then it disappeared, and then you don't think about it again. And so this has been a really good reminder for me of the, the, the very clear leadership that we have coming within the scientific and medical community within Canada. Um, in this field of uh, nuclear medical isotopes. And I, I think it's, um, you know, we should be very proud as Canadians, but it, I've learned uh, through the discussion today and, and hopefully others have as well, that there, there are huge opportunities for us, but, uh, you know, government support is needed. Um, and, and in some ways it's, you know, clearing those barriers that are there, but, um, you know, investments in research and, and uh, supply chains and other things. And so you know, to me, it's been a very, very worthwhile uh, use of my time today. And thank you to each of our panelists for taking a, a, what is a, a definitely a, a complex subject and, and uh, making it you know, pretty understandable as far as the, the successes and the challenges that we have. 
And so, you know, I'm happy to work with James and others on, on any sort of advocacy that, uh, that is needed um, so we can continue to really, um, you know, frankly, reap the benefits uh, of this sector um, because it's good for the economy. But I would also say it's as important for the health of Canadians as we continue to deal with the, the, um, the growing uh, number of, of cancers and, and um, uh, numbers of cancers that we see in our country and, and around the world. And this is one of those areas that um, you know we can actually make a huge um, uh, positive impact in people's lives. And so you know, thank to, thank you to everybody involved in this sector uh, for the work that you've done, and for the innovation that you continue to do. And I look forward to seeing how we can I can work with government um, and the, uh, the the industry um, to uh, you know continue that success and and to make sure that Canada continues to really lead the way um, here at home and, uh, and internationally. Well, thank you very much, uh, John Aldag, for, for your comments now, but also for, for chairing that important committee, the Natural Resources Committee of the, of the House of Commons. Uh, thank you, James Cognac, Andrea Armstrong, Jennifer Chapin, and Rob Muller. Really appreciate your time and the work you're doing to advance this uh, really exciting cutting edge sector in Canada and uh, keeping us, uh, um, uh, I know you don't want to get into the competitive thing, but you know, it is a competitive advantage and we should be really proud of what you're doing. So congratulations on what you do. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody. Bye.